I All right, great. thank you everyone for coming to the Student Voices panel, veteran and military students. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna have Eric make an announcement about a related veterans event. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Eric Durant. Uh, I'm a professor of fine art here at the college. I've been here for the past 10 years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm also a veteran, one of the few faculty members, uh, I think, that uh, um, has done their time. Uh, but uh, I served in the Navy back in the early 90s, a long time ago. <laughs> it seems to get farther and farther every year. Um, so uh, uh, anyways, um, uh, over the past couple of years, uh, I'm a professional sculptor in addition. I basically, I make sculptures that look like real people, uh, and that's what I've been doing for many years. I do public monuments. I've done a, um, a variety of different monuments out there, uh, including the New Bedford Fisherman's Monument, Tom Lopes, and I'm currently working on Elizabeth Tabor for the town of Marion. Uh, for the past couple of years, though, I've been working on my own side project, which is just something that I wanted to do in order to give back. Uh, it started out with a, a single portrait bust that I did of someone who's a former student here who is a veteran. Uh, truth be told, in the beginning, I mostly sculpted him because he had an awesome beard. And uh, there's something about, like, you know, I don't know, like veterans and beards, I don't know, um, you know, contemporary beard culture. But it kind of turned into something else, and I enjoyed the process of sitting with, uh, um, with John and talking and telling stories because uh, part of doing a portrait is that you have to sit with the person. So the person comes, they spend time in your studio, and you talk. You know, that's just what you do. Uh, so I enjoyed that process. Uh, and so we kind of you know, rolled it around, turned it into a little bit of something else. Uh, as a veteran, I, I always participate in various events. But truth be told, I don't really like parades. Um, I, just, I just don't like them. I kind of like studio parties where you get to hang out and talk to people and maybe drink some beer, um, things like that. And so we came up with this idea that we would have a, um, a studio party and an unveiling of the sculpture of John, and I would give him the first copy, the first casting of it. And so in, after that, it was so successful that we opened up a nomination process where, uh, whereby each year from now on, I'm going to sculpt one veteran. And on Veterans Day, we're going to have a party. And I'm going to give the person that initial sculpt. So we're on to, uh, so last year, um, around this time, we opened up the nominations. And, uh, um, and I met. Uh, um, Ronnie Legere, who's a veteran, he did 26 years in the military. Um, his rack sort of kind of goes over his shoulder. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, but strangely, he also has an awesome beard. Uh, but uh, um, we will be presenting the sculpture to him on uh, on Sunday, November 11th, uh, five to seven. It, we checked; it does not conflict with the with the football game. Okay, so. Uh, so if you're looking for something to do on 5 to 7, you should come by the studio, hang out, um, you know, have a beverage with us, talk to some veterans. Uh, hopefully, uh, John will come with the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Club, which, uh, which is more leather than my studio had ever seen before. Uh, but uh, that was a lot of fun. But they will hopefully be coming back this year as well. Uh, and the studio will, of course, be open. So if you're interested in more information, you can find out uh, my website is ericdurant.com. Uh, my Insta handle is eric underscore Durant. Um, and there's Eric Durant uh, Sculptor on Facebook. And those are all places that I will be sort of filling with information. Hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> and now he's back to class. <laughs> So before we get started, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what we're going to do for questions at the end if there's time. Kerry from our office is going to hand out index cards if you do have a question, if you just want to write it down and then raise your hand. Because of the sensitive nature of some of the experiences that our veterans have gone through, we're just going to pre-screen the questions to be on the safe side. So now I'm going to introduce our moderator, also a veteran, John Praviti from our advising office and staff advisor to our Veterans Club and veteran of the Marine Corps. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for coming today. Um, we got a really a, a tremendous panel of young uh, Marines and Army soldiers here today, and they're just going to explain some of their experiences. Um, first thing we're going to do is tell, so tell you all a little bit about ourselves, and that includes our name, our branch of service, our rank, our occupation when we were in the service, um, when we served, although for me it's much long ago, and where we did deploy. So. 
As uh, Beth said, my name is John Praviti. I'm an academic counselor here on the college, also an adjunct instructor, and I am the faculty advisor for the Veterans Club. Um, I was in the Marine Corps a very long time ago, back in the 80s. Um, my rank when I got out was I, I, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. When I got out, I did three years active and a year in the reserves, which I really didn't like the reserves that much. I liked being in, in uh, uh, the actual service itself. Didn't like the um, reserves. It's because I felt it was really lackluster. Um, didn't miss a lot of the um, camaraderie that you normally have in the Marines. Um, my military occupation, well, I was a 2542, and yes, I actually remember what that is. That's a, a com communication center operator. Back then, it was so long ago, we actually used teletype. And for those of you that don't know what teletype is, if you ever see an old movie and there's paper coming out of this thing, this glass thing, that's teletype. And it's actually holes punched into the paper which basically is the equivalent of today's binary code. So it's how they transmitted messages back then. Um, it was ancient history back then, and it's even more ancient history now. So that was what I did. I did that aboard um, and at land bases and also aboard ship. Um, so um, where did I deploy? I was aboard, I did what we call uh, two med floats, which means I went to the Mediterranean. Sounds really exotic, except you get to go really everywhere. I've probably been to 40 to 50 countries over the time that I was in the Marines. So I went everywhere from Denmark, throughout Europe. Um, I was in um, the Middle East, Africa. And we ended up, uh, went through the Suez Canal four times, which is pretty cool. And um, one, one thing, I ended up in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And I was part of the multinational peacekeeping force while I was there where um, we were there to uh, basically um, sort of in the middle of a civil war amongst the different fighting uh, factions within Beirut. So right now what I'm going to do is hand that over. You guys are going to pick up the mic. And we're going to start with Joe or JJ. Can you guys hear me OK? Does this work? Does, does this work? Yeah. <laughs> this works. All right. Um, my name is Joseph Massey. Uh, I go by JJ. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom. Uh, I was in from 2005 to 2014 when I took a military um, uh, medical retirement. And uh, I started as a reservist. The reason why I joined as a reservist was because I wanted to go to college and that didn't end up happening. Um, I joined as a 3521, which is a motor transport mechanic. I made a quick lap move into military police. I was a field MP while I was deployed. And then I came back and I was on recruiting duty as an 8411. I finished out my career there as a station commander. Um, I was a sergeant when I retired. Um, and that's pretty much a summation of my career there. Uh, it, was, it was a short time between when I got out and when I decided to come to BCC. And I guess we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. Um, but I'll pass the mic and we'll move this along. Sounds good. So uh, my name's Jacob Holtman. I've been in the uh, Army National Guard for five and a half years. Four and a half of that, I spent active duty. I was in mostly down south, Alabama, Fort Rucker, and then I spent a year in uh, Kuwait and Iraq. I'm a corporal right now, which by far the worst rank in the military. <laughs> but um, <Not> true. <laughs> in the army, in the army, being a corporal's corporal's pretty bad. But uh, just rolling with it until I can make my sergeant. Uh, I'm a 15 Quebec, which is a air traffic controller. I'm on a TAC team, so all of our stuff is mobile. So we're meant to go out and set up airfields. But uh, it's really pretty much it. Pass along. Uh, my name is Brittany Hotailing. I was in active duty Army from 2008, right out of high school, 2012. Um, I was at Fort Gordon, then at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, which was really freaking hot. Um, I was a 25 November, so I did IT, communications, like basically kind of like similar to John except new school, like actually reading binary, not holes in paper. <laughs> um, so yeah, I got out in 2012. And since then, I've had a couple kids and started school and just done life. Great. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Caitlin Lee. When I was in the Army, I served from 2008 to 2016 as Caitlin Torres. I was married. See how that went? <laughs> Great. Um, 
So I was in the Army. Uh, I, when I, was, I did a medical separation, I broke my hip at my favorite job. I was a jump master at the Airborne School. Mm -hmm. I was able to teach people a jump master. Yes, yeah, so I was able to teach people how to fall out of perfectly good airplanes. It's pretty fun. Uh, it was an experience, but I, I did ultimately injure myself, and I had a medical separation. When I joined, I was a 91 Juliet, which is a quartermaster and chemical equipment repairer. Long story short, never did it. I worked on trucks, and I was a wheeled vehicle mechanic um, for the first part of my career in Germany. I was stationed in Germany. I did two tours in Afghanistan. I went to Wardak province for my second one and was able to experience what the infantry does and work alongside them for six months. And it was a very eye-opening time of my career. And after that is when I was given that opportunity to go to the airborne school as, and take an infantry position as a woman and become a black hat, which is an instructor at the airborne school. And it, it was at that time period when women were starting to take more responsibility from the men. And men didn't like that. Old school people didn't like that. And I was really, really excited to be that foot in the door. At 24 years old, I was a jump master. I was an E5, brand new, didn't know my left boot from right, my right. Like, but I was able to learn this, public speaking. They really helped me to talk to a sitting in front of 400 I, sets of eyes and teaching them how to jump out of an airplane, but being fun enough to keep them awake is very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's mostly for that for the beginning. Oh, the other thing, yeah, I was, um, I said I was stationed in Germany. I was fortunate to go from Bamberg, Germany to North Carolina. I went from North Carolina to Fort Benning, Georgia. Terrible, terrible place. <laughs> and then the last year, as I did a medical separation, I went to somewhere that I, I thought it couldn't get worse than Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, Fort Irwin, California, I will tell you right now, you are stuck in the Mojave Desert. That was the longest year of my life. It is hot, and you <laughs> have 30 miles off the highway, one road to get to post, and nothing else around it. But... I think that's, do we, are we moving on to? Sure, sure. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, guys, sorry. All right, so, <laughs> since you're so comfortable, uh, comfortable up here. I love talking to you guys. I am going to ask you, why, why did you join the military? Funny story. Okay. I, um, my, one of my best friends was joining the infantry. Go, and he was a guy, one of those, he got out of high school by the skin of his teeth, just wanted to do something else. Well, I met his recruiter at a party playing beer pong. And mm -hmm. he said, if you lose, you have to take the ASVAB. Because he was giving me crap. I said, anybody can do it. I'm sure I could pass that test. Well, I lost, and I did take the ASVAB, and I passed it with flying colors, and it opened up a door that I never thought that I would take. I started learning more about jumping out of airplanes. And that is where I went to MEPS. MEPS is where we go to enlist and pick our job and see what we want to do. Well, I went there three times and refused three jobs, well, two jobs, and the last one, I said, well, I want to join, and I want to be airborne. They said, you're not a guy, you're not infantry, it's probably not going to happen. Well, they, 91 Juliet had no idea what it was. I'm good with my hands, I can work on things. It came with an airborne slot. So I took it, and thank God I did, because I would have went there and probably settled eventually, and I did learn how to work on trucks, so. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it happened over a beer pong game. And I'm very, very glad I was there. Great, I'm gonna ask Brittany, how about you? Um, I hated high school. That's literally <laughs> what it boils down to. Like I left for the army literally two weeks after I graduated high school, 17, like didn't know anything about life and I thought I knew it all. And I knew I couldn't do college. I just knew, I was like, I, if I go to college, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna drop out, I'm gonna do stupid things and it's never gonna work out. And um, a recruiter called the house and was like, hey, you're 17, you want to join the army? And I was like, absolutely, let's do this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it worked out for the better. It, you know, it changed my life, so yeah. Jacob, how about you? So um, I was the typical high school student who never thought they would see the inside of a college. 
And uh, that was a big part of the reason why I enlisted is because I needed to do something. And then again, my whole family was in, so it was just kind of like the next logical step for me. But I actually walked in there and I wanted to fly helicopters. And they looked at me and they were like, you can't be a pilot. You're not an officer. You have no college education. You don't even have a high school education yet. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, then put me somewhere in aviation. They're like, you want to be an air traffic controller? Meanwhile, I had no idea what that was. And I was like, yeah, sure. Will I be able to fly at some point? And they're like, yeah, you guys get to fly all the time. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> but I have gotten to fly in some pretty cool aircraft. Not at all upset about it. Very happy I did enlist. Definitely wasn't the outcome that I had expected when I enlisted, though. Great. JJ, how about you? Out of those airplanes. I would love to jumping if they out would of let them. Me. Nobody wants to fly them. Just fall out. <laughs> well, uh, I could give you the generic "I wanted to serve my country" and all that uh, spiel, but that's not actually the truth with me. Um, I, I tried college, uh, and and I wasn't good at it. And I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to threaten me with military school. If I didn't shape up, I was going to go to military school and all this. Um, when, I, when I dropped out of college, uh, I told my mom, I said, that, hey, I'm coming home. This didn't work out for me. And uh, she said, well, you better find a place to live. Um, so I was forced into a situation where I didn't have many options. As a college dropout, I didn't know what to do. I was working dead-end jobs, and out of necessity, I went down to see what was offered to me. Um, and when I talked to several of the recruiters, I talked to the Army recruiter, I talked to the Marine Corps recruiter, Navy recruiter, um, the embodiment of what the Marine Corps was, um, what they did, what a Marine was, uh, was what really brought me to it. Um, and then when I told my parents about that, they said, uh, well, have you looked at the Coast Guard? <laughs> Thinking that the Coast Guard is a safer bet, which really it isn't, but uh, as a compromise, I decided to, um, to get a career out of, or a, a skill out of being a Marine. And so I picked a technical skill of being a motor transport mechanic and going reserves with the intent to go back to school. Um, but out of necessity and um, uh, need of, of being better is, is really why I joined, if I really boil it down. Um, and then um, I, cho I chose the Marine Corps over every other branch simply because of um, what I viewed the Marines as, what I viewed as the, the best of the best, the most highly trained. Um, my original intention was to go in uh, as an infantryman. Um, but uh, as a compromise to my, my parents and to ease uh, worries, I suppose, I, I ended up going as a uh, motor team mechanic, which I, I don't regret for a second because I learned a skill and still got to the title of Marine and got that, um, that embodiment of the, the core that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the reason why I joined. Great, great. Um, next question, if you want to, yeah, I'm going to just start with the next question there. All right. <laughs> Send it. <laughs> it, it says here, I mean, what, what was your typical day like? And I know that's a, probably a really tough question to sum up, but is it, is it like a job when you're, you're on your end, or is it more like someone's telling you what to do from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep? Someone's definitely telling you what to do. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, telling definitely you. telling you what to do. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess uh, that's a transitional question because there's my experience is going to be different than his mm -hmm. and hers and hers, uh, but uh, boot camp is all relatively the same. When you go to that initial training, it's all relatively the same. Every thought, every motion, everything you do, you're told to do and how to do it and when to do it and all that. Um, but outside of that, uh, as a normal day, um, I guess I experienced three different scenarios. Uh, one as a reservist. Uh, which is uh, one weekend a month, two weeks during the year of active duty time frame, and the rest of the time, it's mine. I do my thing, and, and I'm a civilian, essentially. Um, and then active duty, uh, where you're constantly on call and you're doing your day-to-day -day job, uh, which is very much like a job. And then obviously being deployed, that's a whole different animal in itself. Um, but uh, as a reservist, uh, the duties were, were, were very slim. Uh, during my weekend uh, that I was there, we would get up, we would do a physical training regiment, um, 
and then we would go off and we would do whatever our job happened to be. At the time, I was a motor team mechanic. I would go down to the motor pool and work on trucks and preventative maintenance and learn some more things from the senior guys around me and all that. Um, then as an active duty guy, I was a recruiter. Um, and my job at that point was to, I hate to say it, but meet kids while playing beer pong and invite them to take the That's ASVAB. Right. It's so true. It very much was that. <laughs> and go to high schools and, and, and find um, people that uh, being in the military may help. Um, people that are going home and want to serve their country and do that. Some people are just looking for college money. Some people are looking for um, anything better than what they have right now. Um, so that was my day to day. Um, and then obviously uh, deployments are, uh, are, are different beasts in themselves. Um, that's, you're, the, you're there specifically for a mission. So if, I know that was a very roundabout. Mm -hmm. uh, we digressed a little bit, but sure. uh, we'll, we'll pass it along. Keep it moving. So uh, I kind of have the same ex three experiences as JJ. Uh, I enlisted in the Guard. I spent a lot of time in like a training environment because my school for my job was seven months long. And then after that, they sent me to some secondary programs like CTOs, which is just basically we get FAA certifications through the military. But um, when I was at basic, that's just <laughs> mind control. Just everyone's, every move is just calculated. Blinking. They know what you're gonna do. Blinking is calculated. Yeah, blinking is calculated. But um, leaving there and going to my unit in the guard, I was surprised because I'm in a very small company. We only have 22 people right now in my entire company. Wow. And five of them are officers and only <laughs> seven are NCOs. So the rest are lower enlisted. Yeah. And they take rank very loosely there because we're in aviation. So I'm only a corporal, but I have more experience than some of my staff sergeants, so I'm in a training position compared to them where I'm training them, which is interesting and weird because when I was deployed or during my time at active duty, it was nothing like that. It was the higher ranking was always teaching the lower ranking. My unit kind of does it backwards. They go off of more of an experience base and everything mm -hmm. else. I'm surprised, though, how much the guard has actually taken from me time-wise because I spent the entire three-month summer on orders down on Joint Base Cape Cod doing training soldiers for one of our radar systems. So they actually request a lot more than just the one week in a month for me, but that's because I'm one of the only people in my unit who actually has any experience doing the job. But other than that, it was pretty easy. So similar um, experiences, basically. Basic is the same for everybody. You wake up, you PT, you eat, you PT, you get smoked, you PT. <laughs> like, it's literally your whole day. Um, I, similar to Kobe, spent a year in AIT to do IT. Yeah, my AIT was like 26 weeks plus four weeks plus waiting periods. So I was there for like a year, so that was pretty crappy. Um, and then when I got to my regular unit, I actually got held back from deployment for medical reasons. Um, and rear D sucks. You're pulling weeds all day. You're painting, literally painting rocks. Um, sweeping, sidewalks. sweeping sidewalks, raking lines in sand. Um, yep. So that was fun. Um, but other than that, like when your unit's getting ready for deployment, we're coming back, you're getting trucks prepped, you're getting all of your equipment prepped. When you're in the field, you're actually doing your job. Um, but similar to Kobe, like I was in E1 because I got in trouble and um, teaching E5s and E6s how to do their job. So that, that's kind of fun because you get to tell people what to do when they're normally the ones telling you what to do. Um, but that's pretty much what a day is like. So the first two words that came to mind when I read the question was structured chaos. It's really what a typical all around answer would be for any position I've ever held in the military. Um, a couple of things, the deployments are, you learn a lot from everybody. It doesn't matter if it's the E1 that you're telling what to do as you're in E4 or a corporal or a sergeant, if they know better than you, if they've done it, 
and you're just looking at their rank instead of looking at them as a person, that's where a lot of bad things happen when you're deployed. That's how a lot of complacency, that's when complacency comes into mind. It's, I, being a woman, for one, deploying, I fought and I fought and I fought for what I wanted to do for myself. I didn't want to, I joined the Army as a 91 Juliet, supposed to work on, the biggest thing is water purification systems, mm -hmm. to fix them. At the point of my first deployment, most of that was contracted to civilians, and they were doing that for us. So I was thrown into that spot where I got out of airborne school. I was 19, graduated on my birthday, um, jumped out of an airplane, survived it, was so excited. I got to Europe um, the first week of July, and they said, welcome to the 173rd Airborne, and we're deploying in November. Um, when I joined, I knew nothing. I knew Airborne and the Army was a very tight-knit community. Um, that's an understatement. It's a, really a way of life between different, between just being a soldier, a ground soldier, or the discipline it takes to safely conduct your mission starting in the sky. Um, I did a year there, and like they said, it's, it's a whole nother beast. Like there, nothing is the same every day. One day you're waking up in a tent, the next day you're waking, you're not sleeping and you're driving for 12, 13 hours. Really depends if they need you and you're there, you're a body and you can do it, you got, you're doing it. You don't just do your job. That's never, I never did anything working on water purification systems okay. in the army at all. I worked on trucks and then worked with the infantry. Um, a day with them is like, a day with the infantry will um, make you feel really smart sometimes. Just, they are very intelligent men, <laughs> but they are, they experience so much seriousness in their career field. They are lackadaisy when they can be and just funny. And, but you can always trust them. At the end of the day, you need a friend. If I needed my brother there, my brother's there. Mm -hmm. So getting close as a woman working embedded in the infantry and getting the experiences once I came back. Um, starting from an E1, you, you're told what to do, when to eat, breathe, drink water, literally drink water. Um, I learned leadership very well. It's very cliche. But you learn bad leadership, you learn good leadership. And on a daily basis, you see that, and you see what you want to be and what you don't want to be. And when you get soldiers below you, you put that good knowledge forward and train the next generation of leaders. Because I could sit there and give them all my work and not help them, and they can sit there, talk crap about me, do the job half-assed, and then, oh, sorry. And then I get in trouble because at the end of the day, everything comes down on you. If they mess up, it's your fault. What did you do or not do to control that situation? So a day, every day was always different. You have, to, you have to be able to adjust fire quickly and go from one situation to the next. From working in a motor pool to jumping out of an airplane. But like I said, structured chaos. That is... That's the biggest, All right. that's the only way I think I could clearly tell you guys. So, it sounds like everybody here learned a lot of marketable skills to that, that trans over, trans, uh, transition into the uh, civilian life and to what corporations and companies are looking for today. So uh, it's time well spent. Um, the quick question here, I just want a quick answer. How, does, how do you have to keep in touch with your family and friends while you're in the, in the service? Back when I was in, it was pretty much you wrote letters, and that's, they, okay, there was these things called envelopes, <laughs> and you wrote things on paper, you folded it up, you put it in they an envelope, there was a thing called a stamp, you put the stamp on it, you mailed it to people's addresses. <laughs> that's how they got things. And occasionally you could make phone calls, um, and I, like, when I was deployed overseas, you would actually have to go to this place called the phone exchange, and you would actually have to give them a bunch of money, like 20 or $30, to make a phone call from like Greece to the United States, and like to talk for five minutes was like 30 bucks. And my mother would want to go on and I would say, no, call's done, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, you really had to monitor it. So how did you guys do it? 
I'll, I'll talk about one aspect because it's, it's probably like it's not a big thing that everybody does it differently, but the deployment aspect. I know for me, I liked to, the less contact I had with my family, the easier it was for me. Mm -hmm. I probably in the first deployment called home four times, that's 12 months. Um, the second deployment, it was actually a lot harder. We were there for six months, but I only called once when I got there. I was able to concentrate on my job then without, I knew my family was fine. I didn't need to communicate. Yeah, they were worried about me, but letters. Okay. The best thing is letters and when I get a box of goldfish, that's how. Yeah. Goldfish and learning that chocolate doesn't ship well to mm. Afghanistan. But that's, for, for that aspect, that's how I feel on that. Um, so in basic, you literally get two phone calls. One when you get there, hey, I'm safe, click. And then one when you're like two weeks away from graduating, hey, I'm graduating on this day, you're welcome to come to family day, click. Um, other than that, it's all snail mail, <laughs> letters. Um, you spend a lot of freaking money on stamps. <laughs> um, after you get out of there, you, you pretty much have your phone. You have every form of technology back at your fingertips. So you can text, you can talk, you can Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and whatever else there is these days. Um, but Skype always was awesome too. So yeah, awesome. that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'm gonna go again with the deployment aspect. Uh, I, my dad made me call him once a month because he was always worried about where I was. He was like, oh, just want to make sure you're all right. So uh, I actually downloaded Skype onto my, my laptop, and that's how I used it. We could get, uh, they charged you a whole bunch of money, but you could get, actually get like a little Wi-Fi chip mm -hmm. and like just enough to like make one call home and it ended up costing you like $40, $50. It was kind of ridiculous, but that was their way of like just checking on Nami, and then obviously sending food was, was awesome. I loved when I got snacks and care packages. <laughs> They'd send a letter and then just a big box of snacks. There'd be like 10 words on the letter and just food. It was awesome. <laughs> loved it. It's weird how excited you can get for a, for a new pair of socks. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, or I got razors. socks. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, outside, out, outside of the normal aspect of military life, the only time that you won't be able to keep in touch is, is basic and deployments. And uh, in my experience, um, I, I didn't want to contact anybody because um, there was operational security issues where there were things you could and couldn't say about where you were and what you were doing. And there were so many rules about it um, that it almost took your head out of the game. For, for me, it was, uh, I was there. I was there for a reason. I wanted to do it and get done with it. Um, in, in my experience, you start thinking about home, you start thinking about other things, uh, you could miss something that was in front of you. Um, so I, I didn't really communicate that much, especially when you're, when you're forward deployed and you're doing things. Uh, they don't even have that, that option for you. Uh, you might have like one, one letter or something that you, that you keep with you, but uh, unless you go back to uh, the main base, um, then you're not, and like I said, then there's so many rules about what you can and can't say and everything that, uh, you know, but uh, other than that, it's, it's normal day to day, just like here, you know, you get your phone mm -hmm. in your pocket. You know? uh, when I, um, I, the satellite phones, like I was talking about, there's not many ways to communicate. We had satellite phones, and that's why it's very hard to use them, but not use them, but hard to get everybody the opportunity. Like, they're not going to give it to one person and not let the rest of the soldiers or Marines or, do it. It's not fair. I mean, and then um, I don't know if you guys had it, but my first deployment was 12 months straight. So we were forced to take what's called um, R&R, &R, rest and recovery. It's, it's a super, it's more, I feel it was more stressful for me to take the leave. So I go from Wardock province, Afghanistan, and they fly you in. You get to go home for two weeks. Um, it ends up being about a month with travel and stuff. Um, they fly you to Kuwait and they fly you home. And you literally get thrown into civili the civilized world after being, like I went six months in. So it wasn't like I was there for one month and got to come home. Mine just ended up being six months in for schedule scheduled time. And I had more anxiety being home. And I was glad that I didn't have to do that my second deployment, but I don't know if you guys... We don't do R&R. No, yeah, see, it's, but at 12 months, they would give you 
force you into going home. And it's, it's harder. I think it's harder especially to leave. It's harder on the family to leave. I wanted to go back. Personally, they didn't want me to. So it's a, there's a lot of different, that question is a. Yeah. Unless, well, unless uh, you know, somebody's having a baby back home or yeah, something like hard, that, like, hard. then you'll get, you know, a Skype or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but, but, but other than that, I mean, we, we personally, we, we tried not to uh, communicate while we were deployed. It's easier. Families don't usually understand it, but it is easier for us as soldiers and Marines to focus on our job. Because the job is so different overseas than it is sitting back in North Carolina, calling my dad on a Friday. It's, just, it's not the same. Great. Thank you very much. Question about the food. People always ask me, huh, what's the food like? You want to move back this Best, way? worst experience? Yeah. We have two so now. Quickly. JJ, Guys fight. We did math and picked it up. JJ, go right ahead. Uh, food. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, it's good and bad. There was uh, there was both aspects of it because um, when you're when you're deployed and you're doing things and you're eating on the go, uh, uh, food is is just something to keep you going. Uh, but when you're back home, I think what they figured out, uh, at least while I was in, was that if you give somebody enough rest, you feed them well, and you don't mess with their pay, they'll do almost anything for you. <laughs> So uh, the food at like uh, the bases at Pendleton and Lejeune, that was some of the best catered food that I've ever eaten. You know, every morning I'm, I'm having the guy make fresh omelets and all sorts. It's it like having a catered chef uh, at your disposal every time. And then obviously, you know, I don't know if you guys know about MREs, meals ready to eat. They're pretty much um, uh, freeze dried ish. Uh, bags of food that uh, that are good for like 10 to 25 years so you can imagine what kind of food that is it's high calories keep you going that's all it's a necessity food is to keep you alive and keep going but yeah 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 a lot of that yeah. Yeah, don't eat two or three of those in a day you'll, you'll you know, yeah. it's supposed to be enough for three meals in a day it's one yeah. MREs three meals and not to uh, most people but they, they actually did a transition change from when I believe you were in to while we were in. The, the, the MREs have gotten not so bad. No, They're I'm pretty sure they, good. They couldn't get worse. And, <laughs> and there's, there's guys that are known, you'll always have one, you'll, you'll always have somebody that's known as like a chef. You guys have one of those? Yeah. You, had a, you had a cook that was in your unit that would be able to take something from this bag and this bag and this bag and make some really cool concoction. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a cook. The Walter Not White of the group. Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> now you wanna well, say something about the food? About the food? food if yeah. you ever get the little mini Tabascos <laughs> in the MREs, lifesavers on anything. I used to like stock up on those when people would have them. And I would just keep them with me because it's hot sauce. You put hot sauce on anything and it tastes good. But uh, I have to say the worst food I ever had was when I was in Kuwait at Camp Yering because everything is shipped over from the States. So it's like we had the powdered eggs that you would like mix with water and then boil. Yeah, boil in a bag. It was just, it was all just very processed stuff. The best food that I've ever had is any Air Force defect you go to. <laughs> because it's open 24 seven and they have cookies <laughs> and ice cream. And I could not have been happier when I went to that. There was one that was up in Taji that was like, it was in Iraq. It was a multinational like Air Force defect. So they got all their food fresh from locals. So like it was fresh veggies, fresh meat, and it was awesome. Hmm. But yeah. Good time. Oh, going? Okay. Um, yeah, basically same. Um, I actually had really good food in basic. <laughs> like a lot of people talk badly about wow. the food in basic, but yeah, our DFAC had like awards in the army for being like the best DFAC. It was actually pretty great. Yeah, I mean, you get like two seconds to like vacuum it down, but. Um, but yeah, MREs were always a good time. People would fight over the Reese's and the Skittles and the yep and the apple jelly. Like there was certain pieces of MREs that people would trade. So that was we would, yeah. We would trade literally food. Like I'll give you your bacon cheese for the jalapeno cheese. Yeah. Yeah. First strike bars, fam. Okay. Wait, I have one more. The um, when you deploy the food is just it's food. Um, sometimes we would get the, I think the best worst food was the surf and turf. We'd get steak and lobster and shrimp. And sometimes it was just overcooked or just wasn't right. But you know what? It was 
real. It was surf and turf day. Like they planned this for a month and we're all getting steak and lobster tail. So the best, worst food out there, I guess. Eating seafood in the desert is skeptical. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but you know what? When you're out there, you know. <laughs> At the time, it, it sounded like great. It sounded great. I regretted it like day afterwards, but. Okay, I'm going to ask you all a quick question here. Or actually, it's not really, it's really an important question. Why don't you sort of describe that transition from the military to civilian life, back to college life. Also, like, who or what has helped you um, make that transition? And what resources were here at Bristol were essential to you making that uh, transition? This is where you give your shout out to the people. I think we can all agree that yeah. Beth, Robin is amazing too. Beth is, yeah. they are exceptional. Like they, you, I go to them with anything. I had a problem with an issue with a professor, just not getting cla personalities clashed. And I went there and I, I was so angry that I started to cry. Like I could not, I had rage inside me and they just, all right, sit here. All of it, just everybody in the office, sit here, calm down, we'll email the professor. We're gonna help you figure out what's going on with this. Like, it's a, their breath of fresh air to be a tran like transitioning. Um, I really don't know what else to say, so I'll just let one of them answer now, but I haven't really thought about the question much. So, I have a very long story. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but seriously, getting out was actually kind of tough for me. I'd just become a mom. My, kid, my first kid was three months old, so that was a transition. Moving from Arizona to Massachusetts, where I'd never lived, because I'm from New York. So that was a huge... My baby daddy is from here. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was all like a huge transition. I did the stay-at-home mom thing, had another kid, and then getting back into the workforce. And that's when I was like, you know what? I need to get my crap together. I need an education. I can't work at friggin' McDonald's the rest of my life. I need to do something and like be a role model for my kids. And um, when I started, Robin was actually in like a cubby hole office. I started in June of 2015 and I've been here for my whole freaking life. <laughs> but yeah, Robin literally had like a desk that was smaller than this table in, in a cubby in G yes. building. Mm -hmm. And Beth was like on the other side of the office. It in a small a, office side, yeah right? it was like the weirdest the setup but they were both the veterans career counselor people and i was like what is this setup this is so stupid this makes no sense why aren't they next to each other <laughs> like <laughs> slowly but surely g building happened the little office in g building and that was really really great that's when i became the work i'm the work study for the veterans office um so that's what i became and then carrie is like my life coach carrie helps me through everything literally um and then we got this new amazing office in in e building and that's fantastic and they are literally like I called them the Troika because they are literally like the perfect three individuals. Like Carrie helps with life, Robin helps with everything veteran related, Beth helps with transfer and any class that I hate and want to change or love and want her to tell everybody about. Um, so yeah, they're, they're literally like the perfect trio of people to just do everything for any veteran student in this place. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Students. Beth, I, my sister goes here also and she is a mother of four. At the time she met, she was a mother. Of, did she have the baby? Aubrey, I think she's a mother of two. Very new. Very new. And she was so stressed. And she's like, I can have you. I can take care of you. I'll bring you under my wing. And she helped a, just a regular student maneuver a new school. It's, it's amazing. So uh, mine's kind of weird because still being in the guard, like I still have to go down and do my one weekend month or whenever they call on for additional orders. But it's been really nice because Beth is actually my, uh, my landlord's cousin. I live in Fall River. <laughs> so um, that's how I ended up getting like, pointed in the right, in the right direction. Because at first I had just called the school aimlessly like, hey, I need to go to college. Because I came home from deployment. I worked a bunch of odd jobs. And then I finally decided that it was time to actually do something for myself for once. So I was talking to my landlord about like, yeah, like I called, made an appointment with BCC, and he was like, oh, like who are you meeting with? Like, oh, I'm meeting with Beth Zini. He goes, that's my cousin. I was like, 
Oh, it's, it's awesome. Um, and she has been more than helpful. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. Never thought I would end up in college. Not even for a moment until maybe eight months ago. So she had made this transition really easy. Didn't know what classes to take. All I know is that I wanted to work with my hands. I wanted to be an engineer. And she has definitely helped steer me to down the path that I need to be on for that. So thank you. I know. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a total consensus. This, this group of ladies has, has helped us all immensely. Um, I, I had a, a, a two-year break from when I got out to figuring out what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, and it was daunting, the idea of coming back to school and, and using this GI Bill that I've heard so much about that would help you pay for, for school, and, and I didn't really know any of the particulars. All I knew is this is what I wanted to do, and uh, a few phone conversations and showing up in the office, and I've been steered in the right direction, and, and uh, now I feel like it was always my idea, and I, I always <laughs> knew what I was doing, but no, I will absolutely, I, I feel blessed to have known these ladies. Um, and they have, they have helped steer my career in which uh, that I'm going to be using the rest of my life. And especially at this BCC campus, I, I can only speak for us, but I, I would hope that everybody has this at every community mm -hmm. college. Because if not, they are seriously Absolutely. having an injustice done to them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I feel truly blessed. I think we all do, obviously, is having these, uh, these ladies. Um, my... So when I um, separated, I was, it was a medical separation. Very lengthy process in the military. It's when they finally, I broke my hip, they tried surgery, realized that I, I did not, I fought everything to stay in. I did not want to leave after eight years. I had no plan. I planned on, um, I was promotable at the time, so I was very young and just waiting on points to become a staff sergeant and that very high. Points are very hard to get in the Army, depending on your job. So I was just waiting on that, and I, jumping out of airplanes was my, my passion, and I was okay with teaching students three weeks out of the month from sunup to sundown, and I loved it. So trying to think about during the med board process and the programs they try, have tried to put in place to help you with the transition, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. I, just wouldn't let myself come to the fact that I was transitioning out. Um, I went, so once I really got out, I got out and went, drove from California to Massachusetts. Um, came back home and I started at Rhode Island College. Rhode Island College. Um, I live on the border of Mass and Rhode Island. It's closer, but a four-year year institution, they can't speak for all of them, but I know in Rhode Island, they're, the process, it was more, you're, it's a check the block, you're a student, you're, we are different, veterans are different. So things come, we react differently, we think differently. So I finally said no to them, came here and Beth helped so much with my transfer of my, I took so many college courses in the Army on active duty that they were from different colleges and here and there and I have so much military training and for like speaking in front of people and so many skills that she is so, so good at just tweaking the wording and looking into it more instead of blanket reviewing it. She looks into it and reads it and learns you to make sure you're not retaking a class that you're going to sit there and learn nothing because you know it, if you don't need it, if you have the experience. I'm 28 years old. I'm in classes with, God, I think they're like 17, but <laughs> they're, they're very young. And having the transition here at BCC, I, I drive almost an hour to school because the campus and the support I get it's, and the education is still very, very good. So I'm not giving up anything. I, some people go to community college for convenience and give up that education that you're getting. And this place, it's amazing. It's so really the word that comes to mind, especially all oh, this group of ladies. They need a raise, by the way. I don't know who's listening. I think they should get a raise. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Did we get any questions from the audience or? You should. Because if not, I'm going to ask. I know I time's running short here. Yeah. What do you feel is important for non-military wow. students? 
Why not? Yeah, take one. We have two. Yeah. We've got two. We didn't realize it. We're, we had another one sitting right here. So, hi. Actually, I have a couple of questions. Uh, my name is Livia Newbert, mm -hmm. and um, I have worked. I, I want to thank you all for being really here. Um, my colleague and I, um, Chad Argett Sanger, um, are very happy and proud to have all of you um, share your experiences with us. Um, so one of my questions, I work here with um, international students, immigrants, um, serving in the English as a Second Language office. Um, one of you had mentioned about um, the foods in different countries, I mean, the, the food itself, but like, have you had the chance to experience the culture when you were, like, step out of, you know, your duties and responsibilities and to actually experience the culture in the countries where you've been? Have you guys been stationed, you not just deployed? No. Never so been stationed. I mean, when I was, I spent a little bit of time in Kuwait, and when I was there, I did get to run a half marathon in the city, which was an awesome experience because there was people from all over the world. And it was amazing just to see like how open everybody was like and accepting. They just kind of like, when they went in, like I was surprised at like honestly how big Kuwait City is. Like I only saw it once or twice and I was like, it's just ginormous. Their mall is buildings inside of a building for like a half a mile. I was just, but it's definitely, it's a shock. Some people will come up and speak to you freely, and then other people will do everything to avoid you. It's all just kind of, it's almost like here, like how people were raised. It's like people are raised with different beliefs, and some people are open to new experiences, and other people aren't. That's really what I got from there. Um, culture and food. Uh, so I think, I think my military career uh, in, in finding a new passion, and I love culture and food, and I love traveling. Um, there, was, <laughs> there, were, there were times where I've, you know, I've eaten um, authentic, beautiful tacos out of a food truck in Southern California. Uh, I've had local food from Alaska. I used to, when I was in Iraq, in Habania, I used to pay this little kid that would come around to run to the local market and grab food for me and then come back. So I, w I got to experience the bread, the fruits, the, uh, the veggies, the sheep. I had sheep while I was there. It was fantastic. And I've, I've developed a passion for traveling and food now. And since then, I've been to Iceland and um, um, uh, Italy and France and Germany. And I've been all over the world now. And I, I thank that exposure that I got while I was in that found, I found that passion that I really like to do. So, so do you feel that, that you, those experiences, I don't know if all of you have had the chance to, to have those experiences, but do you feel that in any way has changed your perception of other cultures? Um, you know, the way you used to think of other cultures and other countries before, do you think that experiencing that firsthand um, um, has changed your perception a little bit or has taught you anything different? I wouldn't really say it changed my perception. It enhanced um, a lack of perception that I had. Um, it, it opened a door into uh, what a certain culture is like, and that also um, got me thinking about what another culture might be like. And, and so I didn't really have um, any like preconceived notions of what things were, kind of open-minded about it, and I'm glad I was. That's perfect. Thank you so much. One thing to add to it, um, in the Afghan culture, tea is, they drink a lot of tea, and they do it for um, gatherings and stuff, and it's, they, it's kind of rude not to drink the tea when it's offered. When I was, we would um, go into villages, uh, but part of my job with the infantry was to go in and speak with the women. We would get the women um, into one room, and we would, they, they're not allowed to talk to men. A lot of you probably know that. The women do not speak to the men in their culture. So to get comfortable with them, to find out not only good in, like, information of what's going on behind the scenes that they know and they see everything, 
They don't say anything, they see it. And they also know where the problems are, like the wells are broken or they need pencils for their schools in the village. So we would take our gear off and hand off our weapons to the guys and they would hold security and we would drink tea. And I remember the, the tea from the culture, they, tea and um, I call it foot bread. I think it's non bread or something, but it's so, so good. Um, I would have, the children would run up and give it to us in the villages. Um, but the culture opening and really taking the time to listen to what's really going on and taking away the violence and the wars and the Taliban and ISIS, like the, there's, there's simple people like us, like they want their well just to be fixed, we'll help you. They, we found out more information from women in that deployment than we ever would have to help stop the Taliban in that area, then it would, there's so many things we couldn't have found out without having two women in a room with a female terp and learning everything without the men knowing. So yeah, the tea probably brought, you say like full, and it, you, I feel that closeness, because I would have never, I see the burqa, or I see, I see all of that and I don't, I still, I, my heart races. Not gonna lie, I, there are certain things I see around here. If I see anything, like a head wrap or something, and I get nervous, but then I also think back to, you've gotta take the good with the bad. Yep. So you see the humanity in, the hu in the people. The humanity, that's mm -hmm. the word. The humanity, like, I wouldn't, if I didn't do that on that deployment, I wouldn't have seen humanity, so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think that is pretty much a fantastic note to uh, end on. I'd like to thank our panel members here who were fantastic. We can just give them a round of applause.